Abu Simbel Temple Complex, 1255 BCE. The men and women of Nubia gather to see the man who claims to be their ruler by right of conquest. But they see more than a king. Ramses the Great has come to inaugurate the enormous temple he has built, one that he commissioned to overawe and Egyptianize the Nubians. Its official name, the Temple of Ramses, beloved of Amun, and it's a temple to himself. The entrance is flanked with statues of Ramses, 66 feet high, and inside he's enthroned as a god within the divine pantheon. The walls tell of his great deeds at the Battle of Kadesh, his victories over the Sheridan and the Nubians, and his treaty with the Hittites. Alongside him in the inaugural ritual is his great wife, Nefertari. Her own temple is within sight, but she's breathing hard under the desert sun, for she is dying. And soon, her husband, the God King, will face the rest of his long reign alone. This episode was made possible by the fine folks over at Total War Pharaoh, a phenomenal new entry into the Total War franchise I am super pumped about that also ties into today's historical tale. And it's available to snag right the heck now at the link below. Go forth! Last episode, we talked about the Battle of Kadesh and how Ramses used it as propaganda for the rest of his reign, despite the fact he essentially lost. Or did he? Because Ramses had a workaround for that. You see, when he got back to Egypt, he simply declared the battle an overwhelming victory, and he carved this achievement into the walls of temples across Egypt. In Egyptian religion, temple walls were sacred spaces, considered the actual words of the gods. So by carving his victory into temples, he essentially made that victory true. Which is kind of ironic in a way, since most people don't remember Ramses for the Battle of Kadesh at all, but rather as Egypt's greatest builder. See, when he came to power, he didn't realize that he'd have such a long reign. In fact, his father had died early. So in a panic, Ramses entered a fever of building projects. First, he hit the low-hanging fruit, completing temples his father had nearly finished and, you know, chiseling his own cartouche onto them. Next, he put his stamp on some things that he hadn't strictly, you know, built. Noticing that the shallow wall carvings of previous dynasties were easily obliterated, he ordered his name and scenes carved so deep so they couldn't be altered and so the deep shadow made them more dramatic. Next, he launched perhaps his greatest project, moving the capital from Thebes to a new city in the east, built using one of his father's summer palaces as a starting point. This new city, named Pur Ramses, or Domain of Ramses Great in Victory, you know, what else, was more of a military base than a cultural center, however. For Ramses knew that much of his early reign would be about securing and patrolling Canaan and Nubia, and it would serve as a launching point for those expeditions. When the army marched to Kadesh, it did so from Pur Ramses. Then came a massive mortuary temple complex, the Ramesseum, where he could be worshipped after death. At the same period came Abu Simbel and enormous statues across his territories, all of whom proclaimed his great victory at Kadesh. Unusually, though, these did not merely depict Ramses as a king, favored by the gods, who would one day join them. No, they showed him as already deified. Not only that, Ramses would make sacrifices to himself, or rather the god he would be. So stay with me for a moment. Ramses would go to the Ramesseum and pass giant statues of Ramses and carvings of Ramses sacrificing to Ramses before he, you guessed it, sacrificed to Ramses. And if you think that's bananas, there's also some evidence he would sometimes stand on the lap of his giant statues and throw gifts into the crowd below. Now, this is possibly not just due to arrogance. Coming from a new dynasty with a less than stellar bloodline, Ramses likely thought these displays were necessary to justify his hold on power. But let's not absolve him totally of ego either. His diplomatic letters to his enemies turned friends the Hittites betrayed a certain prickly, quarrelsome nature and a tendency to lash out if he felt disrespected. His correspondence is full of complaints about the quality of diplomatic gifts. And once, when a Hittite king asked that Ramses send Egyptian doctors and medicines, the best in the ancient world, mind you, to help his sister conceive a child, the pharaoh kinda snapped. She is 50 or 60. <laughs> no man can prepare medicine to help her. Yeah, it wasn't surprising that Nefertari handled a significant amount of the diplomatic letter writing, her correspondence being far more, well, diplomatic. At least it was for the first 25 years of his reign. Because by year 24, Nefertari started to weaken. Temple reliefs at Abu Simbel show their eldest daughter conducting some inaugural rituals, suggesting that Nefertari, who was herself a major feature of the temple, 
probably had to bow out. When she died, he interred her in a massive and opulent tomb, the largest in the Valley of the Queens. And while he took another chief wife who he favored, it's clear that Nefertari was his greatest love. Now, the irony of Ramses' reign, however, is that all of this constant effort to secure a legacy worked a little too well. First of all, his building projects set a standard that none of his successors could live up to, especially if they believed the propaganda on his temple walls. Nine other pharaohs would choose the name Ramses, but with none of them ever truly recapturing his glory. And speaking of those who came after him, that itself became a bit of an issue. See, Ramses is recorded as having 200 wives, including two daughters of Hittite kings, and from those wives, he had around 100 legitimate children. So many that he actually, symbolically, married several daughters in order to keep their status high. We think around 50 of these children were boys, with a line of succession that was heavily complicated by being born to multiple wives of varying rank. Now, we've talked a lot on this show about the problem of rulers not being able to produce a male heir, right? Well, here's the rare instance of a ruler with too many male heirs. This alone might not have been a big deal, though. After all, Ramses not only promoted and favored his sons to an unusual extent. The first eight were featured in order on several monuments. He actively raised their profiles. No, the problem was that he just lived so darn long. His first son with Nefertari, a hardy man who served as an army commander, died a year after his mother. His second son was crown prince for 25 years, until the 50th year of his father's reign when he too died. Ramsay's third son had already passed away at that point, so now his fourth son had become heir. That son, Kaya Mwaset, has been called the first Egyptologist. A high priest, he made it his life's mission to uncover and restore artifacts and tombs that were ancient even in the time of Ramses, with some burials stretching back a thousand years. However, he'd also occasionally stamp his father's name on artifacts to symbolically claim them, even while restoring them. In his role as priest, he also helped his father celebrate the said festival, a celebration that was conducted for the first time in the 30th year of a pharaoh's reign, then every three years after that. Ramses celebrated 12. He ruled for 66 years, well into his 90s, and each year he sent more and more of his beloved sons to the massive tomb he dug out in the Valley of the Kings. By the time Kayamwaset died, so many of his brothers had already gone to the tomb that it was actually Ramses' 13th son, Merneptah, who took over as crown prince. And it was he who, when his father finally died, oversaw the funeral rites and burial. Yet Merneptah was already 70 and would only rule for a decade. His sons and grandsons, their power increased by Ramses having named so many children to high positions, would then squabble for the throne, ensuring that the 19th dynasty survived only 24 years after Ramses' death. This period of infighting weakened Egypt ahead of the Bronze Age collapse, which sent the whole region into a decline. Were it not for a strong pharaoh of the 20th dynasty, Ramses III, borrowing his distant ancestor's great name, Egypt might have collapsed entirely. But even so, Ramses' legacy was secure. Having shaped Egypt so thoroughly, it was inevitable that later generations would know him as a great ruler. A huge bust of his head remains a central attraction at the British Museum. Abu Simbel is one of Egypt's most famous sites, and his monuments inspired Shelley's famous poem, Ozymandias, reflecting on the passing nature of power. It's no wonder that in 2021, when the Egyptian government moved 22 pharaohs from the Egyptian Museum to the new National Museum of Egyptian Civilization, in capsules decorated like traditional funeral boats, the mummy of Ramses the Great attracted extra attention from the press and onlookers, and preceded by actual chariots. The victor of Kadesh, the great builder of Egypt, once again made a procession to his honored resting place. Now that is a lasting legacy. But, you know, maybe you think you could do better, right? Well, if so, you can now put your money where your mouth is by forging your legacy as the next ruler of Bronze Age Egypt in the epic new game, Total War Pharaoh, who we totally thank for making this episode possible. Total War Pharaoh is just the ultimate Bronze Age strategy game where you can not only explore ancient Egypt during its last Golden Age, rendered in just incredible historical detail, mind you, but where you can also forge your own path and try to stand against the Bronze Age collapse. The single-player sandbox campaign is just absolutely massive and allows you to take control of eight different faction leaders spanning a variety of rich cultures of the period, but that also offer their own unique play styles. For instance, you could become a fierce warrior or brilliant tactician and then lead massive armies into 
do epic real-time battles, or you could use grand strategy to conquer and manage an ever-evolving economy and boost your own political standing in the courts to defend the rich lands of Egypt, Canaan, and Anatolia. But really, one of my absolute favorite tactical elements in this game is that you have to be prepared for unexpected things like intense changes in weather that can directly impact your, or your enemies, chances of survival on the battlefield and utilize their dynamic fire system to engulf armies and spread destruction through forests and settlements. Seriously, there's just a ton at play here, and it's just super fun to strategize how to use it all to your advantage. So, if you would like to join me in proving that you have what it takes to become the greatest pharaoh in history and forge an empire of the ages, just click that link below for your favorite digital marketplace of choice and snag yourself a copy of Total War Pharaoh. And if you do, maybe I'll see you on the battlefield. Well, if it isn't Ahmed Ziad Turk, Angelo Valenciana, Arcolite Games, Casey Muster, Dominic Valenciana, Izzy Coin, Joseph Blame, Guyakoy, and Skylar Holmes, thanks for being legendary patrons, y'all.